Okay, so we're now recording. We're talking about section 9.2 on Leigh Hopital's rule. Um, it's a French uh, person uh, from a long, long time ago. This was on the AP exam many, many years ago. I think when I took it back in the 90s, it, it was on there. Um, and then they got rid of it. I don't know why, but they brought it back. I'm glad they brought it back because it's a really cool rule. So it's, and it's also a great way to revisit limits from the fall semester. So example one, let's just look at something that we've done before. So here, um, you have to find the limit of that expression as x approaches five. Well, usually as a, as a first step, we like to plug five straight up. You just get zero, zero. And that's a problem because that's indeterminate, right? So, because we can't determine what zero, zero is gonna be. It could be really any number. So what do we do back in the day? Back in the day, we just said, okay, well, let's just do some factoring, right? And remember, don't get lazy. You gotta write that limit notation. You have x minus five and x plus five. And of course, x minus five up top. Those cancel. Now you're doing the limit as x approaches five of one over x plus five. Great. Plug in five and you get one tenth and you're home free. That's what we used to do. Or we did other kind of creative techniques like with conjugates or um, um, with complex fractions, stuff like that. Well, what you could do instead is something called Leopold's rule. And here's how it works. It's very, very simple. What you do is um, you plug in whatever A is, what X is approaching A. You plug into both functions, F of A and G of A. If both of them happen to be zero, then you have the luxury of taking the derivative of both numerator and denominator separately. So you take the derivative of numerator and denominator separately and then plug in whatever A is. And if it works out, then you're good. And that's it, you're done. Um, so what's happening here, uh, we are saying that the limit as x approaches to fx over g of x is zero to zero. Um, and you don't wanna say that um, zero zero because the, the limit does not exist. Um, that's not really necessarily true because the limit can exist. So if I do this again, for uh, I'll do it down here. Again, you know, zero zero is indeterminate form. Just take the derivative of top and bottom. And so uh, here's how we'll write it. You take the limit as x approaches five of your derivative of the numerator and derivative of the denominator. So this right here is f prime. This right here is g prime, where we let f equal x minus five, and we let g equal x squared minus 25. Now, plug in five, and it's like magic. You get one tenth. Same thing that we did when we um, factored and simplified. So that's something you can do all the time now. But when you have zero, zero as a scenario, let's try another one. So this was kind of a funky one. Um, and actually, let me pull up my... Um, filled out notes and pull on my other device here. <clears throat> Give me one second. Ooh, I don't have it here. That's weird. Okay. Um, I'll have to locate that somewhere else. It's okay. Um, I'll just plug in straight up my calculator. So if I do, let me type in um, the function first and under y equals. So if you go to y, go to your calculator, hit y equals, and type in that function that you see right there. I'll go to mode, make sure you're in rating mode, very, very important. Then after you just go to y equals and type in whatever you see there, and be OCD with your parentheses, obviously. Like I would actually strongly encourage you to you know, put parentheses like this and like this, just so you don't mess it up. And then uh, once you have it in, hit second mode, quit out to the home screen, or you can graph it too, I don't care. And then what you do is you hit alpha trace y1 and just type in one. And I get 0.158, right? Or 
0.159 if you round up. And then let me do it again. Let's type in 0.1. You get 0.1666. If I type in 0.01, and you see that it's, it's basically going towards some convergence. It's, it's basically consistently 0.16666666 repeating. Hopefully you can recognize that is 1.6. Now, we can't use any fancy kind of rules or techniques um, to evaluate this. And we're just as x approaches zero, obviously, from the right side. Um, but you could just <clears throat> um, do the Paul's rule. So let's, let's do that right now. So we'll do the limit as x approaches zero plus. And uh, I'll take the derivative, which is 1 minus cos x over 3x squared, then plug in zero but there's a problem. The problem you still get zero zero. <laughs> um, you still get zero zero. But here's the thing. It says version two, which means you do it again. You do lay up tall's rule again on this part right here. So you want to do now a second derivative. If you got to do a third, fourth, fifth, sixth derivative, I don't care. You keep doing it until you get it to work. <laughs> so we call it the stronger form of the Leopold's rule. So um, if the limit of each of these is zero and a differentiable, okay, because you got to be able to take a derivative, uh, and you want to make sure the derivative of g is not zero because that's a denominator, um, then just feel free to just keep doing it over and over and over again. So that's what we're doing here. And it does, notation-wise, does look a little different. Like here we just said f prime of a over g prime of a. Uh, but really, um, you're just taking the limit of f prime of x over g prime of x and just keep doing it over and over again until you get it to work. So that's what I'm going to do right now. Um, I don't know why it says part c. We only had, oh, we did have part b in our mind. Okay. Well, anyway, let's keep going here. So I'm going to take the limit as x approaches 0 plus. So again, I did it once. But it was still no good. So you got to do it again. Derivative 1 is 0. Derivative cosine is negative sine x, so it comes plus sine x. And derivative bottom comes 6x. You still have a problem. So you still got to do it one more time. And don't get lazy. You got to write that limit notation. And it's okay to say equals or arrows because, you know, those are true statements. Uh, derivative sine is cosine x, and that's 6. Now plug in 0. And you get 1, 6. So notice I had to do uh, a third derivative, right? Um, I did it once to get one minus cos x, again to get sine x, and again to get cos x. So yeah, that's what we got. You get one six. So again, it's a very, very straightforward process. Um, you see these notes are all actually um, kind of short too, so they're not terribly long. Um, let's look at example three. Now if you look at example three, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so you might remember that I think this was 5 elevenths. Um, you might remember that when we have like sine kx over x, and you do the limit as x approaches 0. Um, I think that was just k. I'm pretty sure that that's what the answer was. Um, yeah, no, it was. Um, and we have something like this here, you had to get a little creative where you had to, um, do something kind of like this here. Actually, I don't remember if I did this with you guys in the fall, something exactly like this problem, but that's what you would have to do. And then you could then do your limit properties and do each of those limits separately where I know this is five and that's just reversed. That's one over 11. 
So you have five 11s. So, you know, you could do these little kind of like fancy techniques and know your, some of your um, limit properties like limit sine kx over x is just k. But let's just do Lipitor's rule. Because right now you have a problem, right? You get zero of zero if you plug in zero right now. That's not cool. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take uh, the derivative. Now you gotta do a chain rule as well. Don't forget, you gotta do a chain rule. So limit state approaches um, zero. And uh, yeah, that's gonna be cosine five theta, but you gotta multiply five on the outside. And uh, so the derivative of sine 11 theta is 11 cos 11 theta. Okay. And then putting zero straight up, five times cosine zero over 11. Five eleven, boom. There you go. Because cosine zero is just one. Easy peasy. And also, you could do this when uh, you get this kind of scenario. What if when you uh, plug whatever x is approaching into your numerator and denominator separately and you get infinity over infinity? That's also considered an indeterminate form because we don't know what infinity over infinity is. Um, so this totally works um, really well. And it also works with negative infinity. You've got negative infinity over negative infinity. Or if you have it mixed up, like positive infinity over negative infinity, or negative infinity over positive infinity. So let, let's look at this one here. Here we have uh, x approaching infinity. Obviously, if I take natural log of infinity over six times root infinity, that's infinity over infinity, right? So this is indeterminate. So I'm just going to um, do Levitol's rule. I'm going to take the limit as x approaches infinity of the derivative of the top, which is one over x. Hopefully you remember that. And the bottom, which will be six times one half times x and negative one half. Now that, that is a little messy. It's one over x and three over root x. You can do a little switcheroo. One over x times root x over three, which is root x over three x. Now I know the answer for this is zero. And I did get lazy by the way, guys, I apologize. I got to practice what I preach. You got to keep writing that notation over and over. I know it's a pain, but you got to do it. And again, I got thrown into here as well. So my apologies for not including that. Okay. Now you might remember we had this scenario with rational functions because this is technically a rational function. You might remember that uh, when you have like x to um, m power plus dot, 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 x to the n power plus dot, dot, dot. Or um, you could simplify this too, but we had this and when n was less than n, our horizontal asymptote was y equals zero. And horizontal asymptotes are infinite limits when x is approaching infinity or negative infinity because it's an n behavior. So that's what's happening here. That's x to the one half power over three x to the one power. So I know the answer to this question is gonna be zero for that reason. Um, or if you so desire, you could simplify it. You could simplify it. That's gonna be um, one over three X to the half or one over three root X. Well, if you plug infinity into the bottom now, you have one over a big number, and that's essentially zero. And actually, again, I'm being lazy, got to keep writing that limit notation. So that's gonna be zero. And you could graph it if you were to actually go to Desmos. Let me go to Desmos right now, actually. Uh, y equals parentheses ln x divided by six <clears throat> square root x. And you can kind of see 
this graph, you know, kind of like um, is negative, then it you know, crosses the x-axis at one, then it's positive, and it starts coming back down again. If you actually were to trace, look at those y values, they do get lower in value as you keep passing through. So it is getting closer and closer to zero eventually. So the limit does uh, exist there. Oh, hold on, this is being stupid. Leave, okay. All right. <clears throat> and then, um, this is kind of a fun one. Uh, <laughs> the vlog, see if you remember you do the vlogs. So that would be a good review. And then we have some um, other kind of more abstract stuff, but I'm gonna kind of hold off on talking about that. Um, Cause I kind of want to give you guys a chance to do some practice. And I do want to check in the other group to see how they're doing. Um, so let's do this one here and then we'll um, I'll end the recording. So yeah, um, let's do this derivative. Uh, that's gonna be, remember one over five X, but you gotta say times natural log of two. Remember, uh, and it's a chain rule as well. So times five. Remember we have log base B of um, U, that derivative is one over U times natural log of B. And actually the natural log of B should, has to be in the bottom. I, I messed that one. Actually, let me double check. Let me double check there, hold on. Um, you know, sometimes I forget this stuff too. So it's good review for everybody. Remember we have a little cheat sheet, that's your best friend. Um, yeah, it's on the bottom, yeah, my bad. So let me rewrite that. Yeah, so I'm doing the limit as x approaches infinity of a big fraction here, one over five x times natural log of two, and then you gotta do a chain rule times five. So it's, it's, so it's basically this then, one over u times natural log of, of b times u prime. So you gotta do a chain rule. And of course the bottom, um, log base seven, so it's gonna be one over three X plus two in parentheses. Times natural log of seven. <clears throat> and you gotta do a chain rule times three. Okay, a little messy, that's okay. We'll flip things around. So you have five over five X times natural log of two. You got to flip over this other guy here. So it's three X plus two times natural log of seven over three. What happens is that these are gonna cancel like they should. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Then, <clears throat> excuse me, you get, um, Natural log of seven, natural log of two, maybe I'll just put those kind of together, times one over X, and times, um, actually, let me combine it like this, three X plus two over three X, because the three and X can multiply together. Well, this right here, and again, don't get lazy, when X approaches infinity, I know I keep forgetting to do that, You can actually do these separately, these fractions separately. And this right here, we know just gonna equal one because they have the same degree. And so you take the ratio of the coefficients, which I know is just one. So the final answer is just natural log of seven over natural log of two. That will get, uh, be the limit of that right there. <clears throat> so again, Leopold's rule, you can see that probably is a multiple choice question. I wouldn't be surprised if that showed up on the AP exam. Uh, I would say probably we'll see maybe a couple of these in multiple choice. Maybe they'll sneak it into one of the parts of a free response question. I'll show how that looks in more recent AP exams. Uh, by the way, uh, all the AP stuff that I'm reviewing with you guys, uh, so let me stop the video now.